So, Cynthia, how big an advantage does a variant on a gene have to give to start becoming more common? Say, for instance, if it makes you, on the average, have like 1% more children. Is that enough to make any difference? Oh, yeah, because it occurs over generations. So it's 1% in one generation, so you increase your allele frequency by 1%, and then if it's 1% in the next generation, it's 1% over the already increased by 1%, and it's like compound interest in a savings account. So if you have a steady force of selection yes. and some allele, allelic variation, it can just go up and up and up fairly quickly. That's right. You can so if get you study high altitude, for instance, it's always the same, pushing yeah. certain alleles to more frequency. Uh, that's the hypothesis, and we, uh, for sure it can happen in 10,000 years, and we have some indirect evidence from Tibetans that it may only take a couple of thousand years. Really? Yeah. Now you've also found a specific genetic locus. Yes. What's that? It's called EPAS1. Well, that must stand for something fancy. Yeah, endothelial pass, prob, uh, something like that. Okay. <laughs> uh, it it uh, is also called hypoxia-inducible factor 2A. That makes sense. Uh, which is links it in with with hypoxia. That's what it does. And so it's a gene that codes for a protein that is part of a transcription factor. And a transcription factor is a protein that turns on, uh, induces the uh, synthesis of protein products from other uh, genes. Okay. So for example, the uh, HIF2A uh, hypoxia-inducible factor 2 is uh, the transcription factor that turns on erythropoietin. So, so that sounds like it's <clears throat> going to make more blood. It's going to make more red blood cells, yes. Okay. And so when lowlanders go to altitude or when bicyclists want to uh, cheat, cheat uh, they'll take a synthetic erythropoietin. That's uh, illegal, but going to Pikes Peak, for example, is not. But it does the same thing. It does the same thing, it yes. It sets off your So your body has built-in mechanisms to detect what altitude it's at and adjust the whole system to cope better. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. It's very fine. And it's very ancient. This one that we've been talking about, hypoxia-inducible factor 2, has been around uh, since the uh, evolution of vertebrates. So dogs... They Cats. Do, they have it. They have it. Yep. Turtles. Yep. Oh, Ants don't. Ants don't. Ants don't, but they have hypoxia inducible factor one. Do they? Yeah. So it, it's not just altitude this allows you to adapt to. It seems like it must allow you to adapt to other aspects of the oxygen in your environment. Yeah. And we think that uh, one of the reasons for the evolution of the hypoxia inducible factors is to ensure adequate uh, perfusion of the lungs mm -hmm. uh, so that blood flow goes through the lungs, enough of the lungs to pick up an adequate amounts of oxygen. And uh, the other uh, is, another possible is possibility is the, um, when we're wounded and mm -hmm. lose a lot of blood and we become anemic. Or right. let's say we have iron deficiency anemia. You see erythropoietin increases. And it's a good thing. Yes. So before we started going to altitude, and even now when we go to altitude acutely, it's an important response. So can you have too much of a good thing, though? Yes, you can. What happens if you get too much hemoglobin? In if you have too much hemoglobin, your blood gets literally thick and literally too thick. And we can tell it's too thick because the heart then has to pump against this sludge instead of a kind of loose mass of hemoglobin. And so there's pathological enlargement of the heart, and eventually you can have heart failure as a wow. result.